I'm going to begin the recording. Hello and welcome to Muse Jam Session Recording 181. This is Danny Beaumont on the Adobe Muse team. Uh, this week I am joined by Razvan, who is one of the developers on the team, and Wezi, who is one of our quality engineers. They will help us with chat today. Uh, if you have questions as we're presenting on anything, you're welcome to throw it into the chat pod. Razvan is the engineer responsible for some really amazing uh, code that is generated in the browser when you publish a Muse website. He is the mastermind behind lots of terrific things like scroll effects and responsive design. Um, I'm also joined by a fellow by the name of John Perry. And John is one of our users. He has been a developer of widgets for a few years. John, how long have you been at it? Um, since uh, February 2014. Pretty good. We're all, I was just, uh, Muse was four years ago, four years old in May. And I jumped onto the project a year before we shipped. So that means this is the longest product I've probably worked on at Adobe, having Honestly. been a long-term product person. Yeah, <laughs> Time flies. Yeah. Um, today's session is focused on search engine optimization. And I have not done this session in a while. I tend to have a bunch of notes. Oh, good. John right. came in. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, John and I have been working on this deck a little bit today. This is my active notes. I'm going to go ahead and uh, put the link in the chat pod here for folks if you want to follow along or click any of the attached links that I have. If you are watching this on YouTube, look in the meeting notes and at the bottom in the resources area there, I will include this link. Um, but here's my thought about it. The, to be honest, I try to use Muse in the real world uh, from time to time just so that I can exercise the new features that are in the product and come up with examples for you as customers. Uh, at the same time, there are over 800 widgets to extend the functionality of Muse, which is amazing. Um, some folks would argue that these are features that should be built into the product. And that, you know, I get email from time to time and someone recently reached out and said, you're driving me crazy. Why is it that I can't just buy news and have everything I need? I need to look at these third party extension developers as well. And my thought about that is that the world in the open web is different. It's amazing how the web is, uses open standards, and as such, it evolves so quickly that any one software company couldn't keep up with it, I would argue. Um, there are core behaviors that should be built into Muse, and I agree with that argument, but the beauty about the extensibility of the tool and the open web is it evolves so quickly. In the four years that I mentioned, actually probably just three, we've allowed folks to develop widgets, and 800 have evolved for a wide variety of reasons. Um, one area that we're going to focus on, as I mentioned today, is SEO. And if I come in and just type SEO here in the widget directory, you can see there's a wide number of widgets that have been developed for Muse that at least uh, come up with that SEO tag. Uh, as I mentioned, John is a widget developer, and he also is pretty advanced in his areas of search engine optimization. So he's going to do a self-help session with me today. Um, what I'm going to do is show you the hooks that I know of in Adobe Muse that allow you to define search engine optimization. Um, this is a consultation with John and myself because it's a little self-serving. I have a website that could use some optimization. And secondly, I thought rather than starting with file new and the basics for SEO, we can look at a more detailed, I think, real-world scenario website and uh, come in with content that's there. So John has a number of widgets. I'm going to go ahead and browse to his site. And Danny, my video says that it needs to be enabled by the host. Really? So Razvan would be happy to do that for you. Okay. Background, I believe. And uh, so, as I mentioned, John, I'm, I'm on your website right now, and there are a number of widgets I was pleased to see that are actually free um, to the community. So John has gone in and developed, he sells a number of um, widgets, and that is his business, 
but we're going to focus a little bit on this SEO section and the essentials widget in essence. Um, this is the one that I've downloaded for web pages and I'm working on that um, to add it into my site. So sort of with that said, I'm going to go ahead and switch over into the app. John, you're also welcome to watch chat. And if you see anything that you think is specific to what I'm covering, jump in, interrupt me, tell me what I'm doing wrong. This is a, it's a jam session after all, which means we have to play together. All right. uh, so, and I don't usually have someone talking to me. It's usually just in chat. So uh, you're welcome to let me know what's going on. So this is my website. Um, I did it a couple years back as my parental obligation for my son's rowing team. And uh, it gets me credit as a parent, and it also allows me to find bugs on the Muse team. So it's kind of best of both worlds. I have to be honest, I have not converted it to a responsive website. Reality hurts. Um, we're in the summer now, and the team is on summer break, so I probably will. This is version 72 of this redesign site. So I iterate on it pretty frequently. I'm updating content probably twice a week. I have a number of hooks that are so this is, again, John and I, we're going to have a consult about SEO. So uh, the site does get updated about twice a week. I have a number of what I believe behaves as iframes. So um, in this instance, it literally is an iframe. I use a calendaring app called UpTo, and I've embedded that app onto a page. Um, I think for the most part, that's about my only embed bits. For a while, I used a Tumblr blog, and I would inject the blog content as an iframe on a separate page. I've realized in the, the world, you know, I think blogs are invented back when it was the only way you could update content on a site. We're not bloggers um, on the rowing team. We just have communications from different coaches to the, to the parents and such. So I have a news page and I no longer really use a pure blogging engine. I have some contact forms that are here, but it's a pretty straight up vanilla site. So um, some of the resources that I rely on when I look at SEO, if you look here, I'm giving you a number of tools. These allow you to evaluate your site once it's up and running and learn a little bit more about the world of SEO. In the area of articles here, I love this beginner's guide to SEO, probably because I'm a visual person. I think designers tend to be, but it really goes through and takes you through a lot of the voodoo, I would call it, for search engine optimization. So um, there's merit to really digging into this article. They have it as a downloadable PDF as well as a static um, a website. I don't know if they've updated it at all. It's a little old at this point. It does have a current copyright on it, but it may be a little dated. And I'm, again, relying a little bit on John as we talk for some of the more modern um, approaches to SEO. So basically speaking, in a Muse website, um, tell me a little bit about uh, page titles, John. I know that I've read a little bit about it. If I come into my main site and when I come into the master page and bring up page properties, I have a couple things going on here. So I like to use Google Analytics to track the traffic on my site. So I've embedded some Google Analytic code. Um, as we talk about integrating your widget into the site, I'm going to change a little bit of what I've done on an individual page basis, but at the root level of the site. So the master that is applied to pretty much most of the pages, you'll notice that I have master inheritance here. So I've got a main master a sidebar and a news master that uses the main master. So what you're seeing here for my Google search engine, I'm sorry, for my Google Analytics, this applies to the entire site. Um, the other thing I did is I put a page title suffix. So from what I've understood about page titles, um, if you can repeat the name of your company, your site, in the name, it's useful. Is, is that accurate? Yes. What do you think of this? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely the correct way of using it. It gets a little tough because when you open multiple tabs, you can't really see the entire words anymore. I mean, I could use PRC. Would that be fine? Or is Pacific Rowing Club going to get me more hits yeah, for things like rowing and the Pacific region? Yeah, Pacific Rowing Club would be, yeah, that's going to be a lot better. Excellent. I love this therapy session. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to hit cancel there.
that. So notice what I did do there. Let me go back just for a second. So I did a space and then a bar and then the name. Um, if you look at the live site, the way that manifests is each site, if I go to Pacific Rowing. And by the way, if everyone goes to the Pacific Rowing Club, you'll help my SEO because I'll get more traffic, which is excellent. Um, I have this lovely hostile takeover um, pop-up that they made me put because the rotating um, header area wasn't enough. We had to really get everyone's attention. But once you dismiss that, you can see that each of my individual pages, so I've got programs and then Pacific Growing Club on the back end. So that uh, basically puts, instead of a suffix, it's a, a prefix, no. Um, it is a, a tag towards the back end of each page. So I have each page named pretty simply. I've got registration, for example. I've got events, but that heavy bar and the Pacific Rowing Club is part of each page title. So if I come in and were to look at an individual page and bring up its page properties, um, under options here, notice that the page name is home. Um, and the file name is index, but that's true for all web pages that are generated from Muse. You have the ability to change the page name to be different than the page title. Is there any relevance to that, John, as I'm working for pages, let's say, other than home? Uh, no, uh, not with the home page, um, but it might be uh, important to point out that the page name doesn't directly have anything to do with SEO. The page name is mainly, like the page name by itself mm -hmm. is only what you see inside Muse, um, but then it's obviously um, added to the page title and file name. So if you, so what I'm trying to say is that if you left the page name as programs and then you change the page title to be something more and then the file name to be something more, the page title and file name will be the only thing that are being looked at by SEO because they're the only thing that's exported. Got it. Got it. Yeah, sometimes you may have, for example, the in your navigation, you may want to name pages differently than they occur in the browser uh, and being able to separate. So if I uncheck same as page name, I can change those values. Um, another bit here that in the spirit of jumping around, there's a check mark for something called the sitemap. And the sitemap is, search engines use a sitemap. It lets them know, um, I'm going to tell you what I think and then you can tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, crawling a search engine allows something like Google to determine if you've made changes to your site structure so that it can reflect those changes. Is it important to have changes in your sitemap? I mean, does that improve your ranking to change the structure? Um, well, something is, uh, well, it not necessarily, it's not necessarily about changes, um, but it can help to make frequent updates, um, to different pages, which anytime there's an update done to a page, Muse will add that to the sitemap and that can help. But like something like changing the URL frequently would be bad. Right. Right. Um, so to be clear, Muse automatically creates a sitemap whenever you publish to a third party host or Adobe's Business Catalyst hosting, sitemaps are generated. And I know in the instance of Business Catalyst, they refresh that sitemap at midnight every day, in essence. I would assume in the middle, in the, in the spirit of um, FTPing sites to a third party host, that sitemap is going to only be updated when you publish to your FTP site. So if you're making minor changes the way I am, let's say twice a week to the site, that's going to generate a new sitemap that will be uploaded to my hosting platform, which is GoDaddy in my case. Um, so that does happen automatically. There's nothing that you need to do for that. It's possible, though, that you would not want to include some pages in your sitemap. Is there, is there any reason you can think of, John, for that, that you wouldn't want to include pages? Is there anything bad from an SEO standpoint about including all the pages? Um, no, there's nothing bad from including the, well, I mean, I guess the only thing that could be bad is, uh, like, let's say if you didn't include it because you were still working on the page and it wasn't mm -hmm. like, uh, let's say you had a lot of placeholder text or something like that, then if it's just a demo page and not something that you're wanting to have, uh, be indexed by Google because it has a bunch of keywords that have nothing to do with your site or something. Right. 
that might be a, be a reason to not include in the sitemap. Yeah, there's, there's two backdoor tricks to Muse that allow you to work on stuff without pushing it live. Um, one would be, as you're saying here, if I uncheck this, don't include it in the sitemap because I'm still working on it, that's great. The other thing I can do is notice if I right click on this page, the pay, programs page, um, I can choose not to export it. See that checkboard, that checkbox. If I uncheck it, it won't be exported. So in theory, let's say I'm working on that page. I say don't include it in the sitemap, don't export it. The hard part is you'll forget you've done that and a month goes by <laughs> and you can't figure out why your programs page isn't showing up. You have to remember to go back and check that box, both here in the drop down and in the page properties. Um, so, John, before you came into my life, I did make an attempt at trying to do some uh, bits of SEO on a per page basis. So, if you come into page properties, um, under metadata, uh, I went and did a big dump of keywords. So, again, just reading around from what I understood, getting them out there, things that people might search for. Um, are good to have in the keywords. Two questions for you. One is, is this a decent set of keywords? And two, should the keywords be different on each page in the site, or do you really just need one set of keywords across the board? Um, they, definitely, they definitely should be different. Um, and I would actually recommend somewhere between three to five keywords mm -hmm. um, per page. And if you act, it, there's a lot of information that uh, talks about that if you don't include them, that's basically fine because Google says they ignore them. But uh, Bing has also said that they use it, they use an abuse of keywords as right. a possible spam indicator. So if I were to just delete them, I mean, you can see I've tried to rack my brain for anything anybody might search for. It's probably unnecessary, you think? Um, yeah, if, yeah, if you got rid of them, it could actually be even slightly better for you depending on how search engines are looking at them. All right, it's gone. The HTML in the head here is just for Google uh, Analytics, so that's all I've got going on there. Now, initially under description, I had had a description here. Um, and if you're just using Vanilla Muse, it's a good idea to have a description. Um, do you want to tell folks what, what should the description say on a per page basis? What's the idea there? Uh, the description, uh, you want to think about it in a few different ways. You want to think about uh, the description of, you would want to write basically what you would, things that you would want people to search for. And then you also have to think about it from the, when a search engine pulls up a list of all your links, if someone were to read the description, that if whatever they typed in, your description would be relevant to what they were looking for. So if we jump out, again, I'd like to understand that a little bit. I hope everyone else is having fun. I'm learning a lot. Um, if I went to Google here and I went to Pacific Rowing Club, really? I can see what's coming up right now. So because the site's been around for a few years, um, we've got this tagline, which I believe this is the description that I have on the home page before I changed it to support your widget. Um, and then it's at least seeing my major. So tell me, how did this happen? What do you think this is reflecting um, in the Google search results? Um, it's usually is showing a few things. It's usually showing uh, sites that, I mean, sorry, uh, links from your page that have a high amount of traffic, but it's also using um, the navigation, whatever you like whatever directly stems from the home page is usually has a pretty strong influence of what shows up in those site links. Okay. Um, and it seems to me like this is from my description. Oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. That part. Yeah. Sorry. I thought you were talking about the links below, but yes. The oh yeah. A little bit of both. This, I was just going to say, that seems to be from the description in, the, in my page settings. Yeah. Um, registration, for example, maybe I don't have anything and it's defaulting to the first text that it's finding on the page because yeah, I, don't, I don't know that I've done descriptions for everything. I kind of ran out of steam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so does it just go ahead and pull from the actual page content at that point, do you think? Was that a yes? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. All right, cool beans. Um, okay. So, 
All right, so we're looking, we've looked a little bit at page content. If I go on to, um, I'll show you an example of life before John's widget came into my life. So if I go to page properties here on the donate page, yeah, I just ran out of steam, so I didn't have anything here. I think I did the first two pages, uh, and then I haven't had other bits that happen along there. Um, other things that I have done to the to sort of, we're going to stick with what's natively built into Muse first, and then we'll go from there. Um, when I went through to structure my text, what I did is created some styles. So if we come in and look at this page, it has kind of a good sampling of text styles. Uh, if you look at my, basically my heading here, so this is the head, this is a subhead on the page. The name of the page would be program. So I don't really identify programs. Um, it's the name in my page title, but programs is not, it's the most important probably bit on the page, but I didn't really bother with a tag for programs, and it doesn't say programs anywhere on the page, but I have, for example, the PRC mission, which I consider to be um, a subtitle or a subheading on the page. If we look at paragraph styles, when you come in to create a paragraph style, so if I just come in and add some text here and call it nothing, and I select that, I can come in to create a paragraph style. So I might go and give it a font, uh, give it some text attributes as I flesh out a paragraph style there. Um, but with it selected now, uh, and in the paragraph styles panel here, if I, create, if I click on the new style button, what it allows me to do is come in and give it a name, so I might call it nothing. And then notice that there's a P tag drop down here. These are P tags or paragraph tags. Um, what they allow you to do is set the hierarchical structure for your site. So this is your way of letting search engines know what's the most important information on the page. So for something like my body text down here, I'm going to go ahead and tag that with just a P tag. Um, because that will indicate that it's body text. On the other hand, for my subhead here, I'm either going to give it an H1 or an H2. John, do you think it's, it doesn't matter that um, I'm starting with an H2 on the page? So if I hit cancel here and just delete that out so I don't ruin my site. Uh, we'll do nothing with nothing. And I'll go ahead and delete that. If we look at this one, so my H2 section head, if I double click on it, you can see that I've defined it as an H2. It's not an H1. Is it bad if I start at H2 and don't have H1s on the page? Um, there is a lot of documentation talking about how important the H1 tag is. I haven't, I, I really haven't seen anything that basically doesn't, uh, say that you definitely should be using the uh, H1 tag. So yes, that to answer your question, that should probably be an H1. Okay, so I'm going to change it to an H1. I'm going to come on in here and make sure that it's an H1. So all this does, it does not change my site in any way, nothing visible about the site. It's just going to change what is embedded in the HTML code whenever anything is tagged with that style. So it's now an H1. I've renamed it as such, and I'll click OK. Can I point yes, out sir. one quick thing? Totally. Okay. Um, so on the, uh, you wrote that in all caps, right? Mm, maybe. It depends. It could be either set as all caps here. How come? Um, because aesthetically, mm -hmm. uh, in search results, uh, it's going to look better if something isn't written in all caps. So it would be just for visual purposes. It might be better to ha write that in a normal uh or mm -hmm. case or capital case, and sure. then use the uh, but then use the CSS property that would come from the text that would force it to be all uppercase. Totally got it. So if I came in here and said um, the PRC mission, as I typeset it, um, what John's suggesting is then come in and select it and make sure in your text style attributes here you set it to be all caps. So that is using CSS but the HTML 
yes that's generated that the search engine is going to see is going to be upper and lower case. Is yeah. that correct? Yes. Sweet. So now that I've made that change, what I really need to do is literally go to every instance where I'm using that subhead and type it as I just did as upper and lower case. But I can make sure that it'll appear in the way that I've just done it using the CSS style. If I go back to my paragraph styles, notice that it says H1 section head with a plus. And if I look at the rollover there, that dotted line is indicating that the case has changed to uppercase. So I'm going to come on in and I'm going to redefine the style to include that CSS approach. I still need to go in and hand type all of the titles as upper and lowercase to take advantage of what John's suggesting, but um, that should do the trick. By the way, if you're not a big fan of paragraph styles and you have an incredible mind, because I think it would be um, a little challenging to do on a per text basis, you can always take a block of text and in the text panel, notice that you can assign a tag here. So um, I can't really think of why that's there other than to make people aware of it. Is there any reason, John, you could think of where you would want to... I don't know, I guess I'm going to make something up, which is if you decide you want to have, let's say you wanted H2s and H1s, but you don't want to define two separate styles and have to deal with it, you could override a paragraph style by setting it here, I think, on a per text block instance. Anything else you can think of? No. Yeah, no. Like you said, it would kind of require an incredible mind to be able to remember all the details that you change things to. For uh, for both Razvan and Wazy, if uh, you have any feedback, because, you know, SEO is, it takes a village. Everybody you talk to has a different opinion. Some people feel violently about <laughs> exactly how things should be done. Um, the whole engineering team is constantly, uh, you know, being challenged, and that's the beauty of open standards um, as to how we approach all sorts of code generation. But Razvan, feel free to feed John any brilliance you have. And John, you're welcome to channel Razvan or Wazi around any of this with mm -hmm. smarts. They can private chat you if they don't want to say it in front of everybody. Yeah. All right. Hope we're all having fun. I sure am. This is very productive. <laughs> the truth is, for my rowing site, I don't really care about SEO. It's not as though we're trying to recruit people from Kansas. It's a local team. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, you are helping me, but it's the gain is going to be very minor in my case. Yeah. All right. I'm going to save my changes though, because I like where we're headed. Uh, so we've now gone in and talked about paragraph um, styles. Um, we've talked about some of the page level settings. Another area that's interesting has to do with photos. So when you uh, place an image on a page, so if you scroll down here on the site, uh, the women's lightweight team just came in second in the nation. So a round of applause to the women's lightweight team. Um, they're rock stars. But I have a photo here that I've just placed. If I were to um, have this page come up with someone who is visually impaired and they were trying to see what was on the page, the screen readers will read out all of the words that you see, but anything that's an image, someone who is visually impaired is not going to know what that image is about unless I add something known as an alt tag or alternate text. This is also an approach that we use if you use a font that is a system font. Let's say for some bizarre reason you're using, I'll go ahead and show it a little bit here. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this out for a second because I can be easily confused when it comes to code. I'm just going to have three items on the page here. So I've got some text here. I've got text here as well, and then I have an image. And in order to optimize this for, again, screen readers, I want to make sure that anything that's not described as text has some sort of a description to it. If I came to this headline um, and I decided for some really odd reason I wanted to apply a system font, um, something really beautiful like Zoff Chancery, <laughs> because that comes up a lot. Is it even here anymore? Well, let's use Vespa. Nah, all right. That's going to be really odd. How about Zappafino? Beautiful. That's awful. I can't even do that. Um, I'm going to pick something else. Okay. Very, very, um, wow. 
1972, I think. But let's say I thought this was the best typeface ever. When I view this now in the web, in a browser, so I'm previewing in browser, what you'll notice is that has become an image. I can drag it off. I can right click to say, uh, um, let's see, open image in a new tab. It is a graphic, right? See, it's a PNG file. Muse automatically renders this. If for some reason I really, really wanted to do this, first off, don't do it if you can bear to not do it. Depending on what you're trying to achieve, let's say it's a Coca-Cola logo. You probably need to use the Coca-Cola font for that, uh, but it will appear as an image in the browser, which means that it's going to load more slowly and be resolution dependent. If you must do it, though, a nice thing um, automatically happens on the part of news. So if I right click on this and I view the page source, uh, we can see this is where it's nice for me to have a really small page. We can see that image. So here's the image that I called out. It's there in the code. But notice what automatically happens next to it. We generate what's known as alt text or alternate text for that image. So you don't have to worry about it. If I came in and said, women take first at the 2016 Youth Nationals Championship, and I republished, Muse will automatically generate the correct alt tag for that, Im for that text that actually is being rendered as an image. Um, same thing for images. So tell me a little bit about images and where it's relevant. If I just had a photo of rowers here, what kind of um, text would I want to travel with it? What alternate text should I apply to something like this, would you say? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> totally. You were off chatting, I know. Um, <laughs> Uh, so if I, when I have images in my site, so if we go back to the main site and I get out of here because we don't really need it. So here I am on my main site and I've got a number of images that are placed on the site. Why would I want to put alternate tags, alt tags on these images? What's the advantage? Um, well, uh, in personal experience, um, there have been many times where uh, I have found pages of mine in search results that um, you can see in the description that it is using the alt text from the image. So basically, it really only showed up because mm -hmm. uh, the image had alt, the alt text that happened to be relevant to something that I was searching for. So that's one scenario where it can be extremely helpful. So in this case, Obviously, there's nothing, well, who knows? Let's pretend that women all around the country are looking for the best rowing club to uh, sign up to and move to the Bay Area. I know, it's a stretch. Um, let's say I wanted to make sure that this image was uh, captured as part of my search engine optimization. What I can do is select that image, and in the hyperlinks dropdown, I have the ability to define what's known as a tooltip. So the tooltip, right? Am I doing this right? No, the, the tooltip is uh, debated on whether or not it's important, but the important part is when you right click that image. Right, exactly. Um, see, is see this edit image properties. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So, uh, right, tooltips tend to be if you roll over something, that little thing that pops up. So um, it allows you to expose actually in the web interface details. So if I, if I decided that um, this is PRC uh, Varsity Women's Lightweight. Uh, silver 2016 winners. Yeah, that'd be perfect. If I could spell. <laughs> so I can also copy this and add it as a tooltip if I thought it was relevant. When I click OK and preview in the browser, the alt tag will appear in the code. There's that hostile takeover again. So if I come here, it'll appear in the code. But now it should be if I roll over this guy, I get a tooltip. Where's my tooltip? Sometimes it takes a second. Maybe. There we Refresh. go. Yeah. There's the hostile takeover.
So I stay for a minute and then notice that I get a little definer. So if you have a site that you want to define what your images are about, you can add the tooltip, but you definitely want to add the alt tag on a per image basis. All right. Moving right along. Uh, real quick, uh, someone asked earlier uh, the difference between H1 and H2 tags. And uh, I thought this page would be a good example. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, the woman take second at, like I was saying that that would be a great H2 tag. Um, but I don't have any H1s on my page, though. That's true. We just went and changed them to H1s. So they should be H2s, but is it important to have an H1? Should I put something that's an H1 even if I hide it or layer it under a photo? Is that bad no. voodoo? Yeah, definitely don't hide it. Um, that can be looked at as spam. Um, mm -hmm. I will have to look into that. I hadn't really considered that it might not be ideal to use an H1 tag, but, um, but I will, I'll definitely look into that. See, this is like called stump the chump. See, if it were me all by myself, A, I'd be talking alone, and B, I get to put you on the on the put you on under pressure instead of <laughs> you're like, man, what did I sign up for? Okay, <laughs> changing it back to uh, H2s, and I'll rename it so that all of us don't get confused again. So we're going to stick with that for now. Um, yeah. Okay. See, it's reality. This is just a lot more fluffier. I'm going to go back to my notes. Um, I have some, it's a few years old, but this is the checklist in order of priority from our engineering team. So ways that you can optimize your SEO, and we are going to spend 10 minutes on um, John's widget, so I want to get there in just a second. But uh, first off, obviously having external links that point to you and you pointing to external links. The more people click uh, to drive to your site, the more it's known to be a serious thing that gets priority. Um, so internal and external links that point to pages. Uh, Steve Harris of Muse Themes has talked about SEO, and he spoke about the idea of even having one of those disgustingly heavy footers. So if you look down here, um, I have a pretty light footer. It's just got the weather and... <laughs> A few links but what Steve Harris had suggested is actually showing all of the pages of the site in a large list down in the footer makes sure that every page is linking to every page in the site do you think that's that's really important John would you agree with that yeah that, that I would say that that definitely can help so is there any other way to get there that you can think of other than having a, a stinky big footer um, down here with all of the links to all the pages? Um, one thing that would be helpful to have, it, it's, just, it's, helpful, it's just helpful to have a lot, of, uh, a lot of your pages linking to each other to give it a kind of structure. And one of the thing that's very helpful is using breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. The breadcrumbs can be really helpful in uh, having a, helping a search engine understand the basically the structure of your site and being able to find links and their order in your website. Yeah, I wish we had, we, we have a, a widget for menus that allows you to dynamically reflect the site plan. I wish we did breadcrumbs because there are third party widgets. Do you have a breadcrumb widget yourself? I do. Funny, funny that. <laughs> Good plug, Danny. But you have to manually generate all of the breadcrumbs, and you have to remember to change them if your site structure changes. Is that true, or did you find a way to sort of suck it out of the site plan automatically? No, that's that's true. Um, and the only thing that uh, my widget does is it grabs the link of the current page. You have the option for it to grab the link of the current page. But, yeah, no, it doesn't automatically change any previous breadcrumbs. Yeah, I was uh, I was playing around. Muse Themes has one as well, and they're kind of nicely styled. I think Cookie might have it as well, but uh, it's hard because you got to remember. I mean, once your site is set, you're not changing things much. So to swing through with breadcrumbs, um, but how would that help? I mean, if the breadcrumb is really only showing where you are in your hierarchical structure, like well, one or two levels deep, is it showing all of the pages on the site in one page, one place? Um, it's well, it's doing a similar thing that sitemaps does. Um, but the one key thing that's different with the breadcrumbs that 
I create is that they use schema. And if you search for anything with J26, you'll see that the, uh, the green links that, or not links, the green, uh, yeah, it's usually a link that shows up in the uh, search results. When you search for anything with mine, you'll actually see the structure that the breadcrumbs have created. Oh, I know. You're begging me to go search for your site. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Shameless plug number seven. It's okay. We're all allowed to plug. Um, so if I went to J, what does J26 stand for? Was that like how old you were when you set up the site? Are you like Adele? Are you going to be J32 soon? Or <laughs> Just check it. No. It's just the letter J, and I've had 26 has just been my favorite number for a really long time. Uh, and then I'm Danny 23. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, so actually, it's if you if you go to Google and let's say you type in uh, Adobe Muse J or J26 SEO, um, okay. and then uh, let's see. Oh crap! Oh no. Okay. So if you look at uh, so I recently updated my breadcrumbs, and it doesn't look like web pages is reflecting it correctly. But if you look at the professional services, and this you uh, don't, but not clicking on the link, the green right. uh, below, do you see how the way that yeah. that is structured, rather than just being a link, that's created because of the schema inside the breadcrumbs. So in essence, you have a breadcrumb on this page that probably says home SEO business local professional services on that particular page that. Yeah. Breadcrumb exists. Got it. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think people like Razvan should go stop their day job and um, their summer break and just make a breadcrumb widget for us personally. But there's my shameless plug. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> Getting in deep trouble. <laughs> um, uh, let's go back to the list, see how it triggers. So we spoke about links. Um, you can, unique content about something users search for, always a good point. We talked about uh, P tags in H1, H2, page file names that match search terms, so looking for common words, you know, as you name things that would align. Um, we talked about that already. The description, no more than 160, um, although Google's getting more flexible on this, and I do have a pointer to an article there if you want to track that down. Um, social stuff. I think you widget developers should come up with like a social pack, like a, like a widget that allows you to go populate all of your social links in one place and then have the icons appear. But the world of social is overwhelming, I think, for things like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and um, building out the brand for a website owner. I think that's a really great place where you could build a widget that could just service all of these social avenues. What do you think? Great idea? Uh, I, yeah. Can, yeah. <laughs> sorry, can, uh, can I repeat the statement? Yeah. Um, what I was saying is I think a great idea for our third-party widget developers. The world of social is complicated. So just putting a link to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Flickr, whatever the heck it is. Let's say you have a small business and they have a social presence. Um, to build out just one kind of a widget, I think, where you could populate all of your social links, all of your social profiles, and then add that when relevant to your site, I think feels like a really powerful widget that could be developed outside of Muse to just manage the social world. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, right. That's okay. Not every social plug that I throw or every... Uh, plug I throw your way has to get caught so <laughs> um, we talked about metadata on page properties so registering a site URL with Google and Bing um, what's that about um, you know? that is uh, basically just for a webmaster uh, set, registering the URL with Google webmaster is probably uh, I, I'm am amazed that people still use Bing I guess it can be a little bit more but the main one is going to be Google Webmaster for multiple reasons. Um, one, you're going to be able to tell Google which uh, version of your site you want to show up. So mm -hmm. like, uh, whether or not you want www to appear in the domain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, you're able to see whenever Google finds a page that has a broken link. And that is probably one of the most important because you want to make sure that you're totally on top of 
uh, making sure that your broken links are redirected to a working page. Okay. So I'm going to just take some notes. I'll go look there later. <laughs> oh, and then um, Webmaster, you can also see um, if you are using any widgets that have schema, you can see uh, the type of schema that is being created if you go inside Webmaster. Okay. Funny you should mention that. So John has a widget that um, extends what Muse does specifically um, for search engine optimization. So let's take a look at that a little bit today. As I mentioned, I downloaded it, oh, this morning at about 6 a.m. when I finally got serious about this session, and I was beginning to implement it. So, um, John, it's free. Um, I have a link to it there in the resources tab. Uh, the first thing that I, and I watched the video for the, the simplest widget, I think, I don't know, it's not the business, but I think it's a web page widget. And um, I went in and played a little bit. So down towards the bottom of my page, I've added his widget. The way I did it was to go, you can go to the Muse, Adobe Muse directory if you'd like, or just go to j26.com directly, um, and you can download it. He has it in his essentials section of widgets. Um, in my library, I basically installed that here, and I've dragged it on the canvas. Um, with it on the canvas, I went in and did a couple things. So you talk about um, having an image. How does that image play? Um, the image is uh, really important inside basically any social media. Um, whenever you share an image, um, it will use the image that you specified inside this widget. Um, also on my site, whenever you scroll down, there's a little thing that pops up of uh, other pages that you might be interested in, and that is using the uh, image tag that's generated from the widget. Okay. So, and then um, there are basically a lot of services that it, whenever they're using an image to link to a page, they search for the image that is being uh, added through that specific meta tag. So should it be more of like the logo? I mean, for this site, for example, I've got, you know, this PRC logo and this header. Should that be the image, like an iconic representation of the business? Or is it? really just any kind of a random image? Um, it's, it's better to have the image uh, be something more appealing that um, would have to do with something specific with the page. So you might, you probably wouldn't want to have the image be the same on every page. In gotcha. like this page, for example, um, you could have uh, the one picture at the very beginning of the, the row winners. Mm -hmm. You could have that as the image or anything like that. But Okay. It's, it, seems, it feels like something that you should update from time to time, and if the content of your site gets refreshed, should you try to make a point of updating that image as well? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, the other thing I did is I took my description out of the, the, the site properties, the page properties, and I pasted it in here. So this is my description for this particular page. Um, we also have the fancy category which uh, has a really fancy name, but I s selected sports and outdoors. What is the fancy category again? So fancy, uh, fancy is a slightly, do you, have you heard of fancy, the social platform? I haven't, but I did hear about it in your video. No, it's <laughs> new to me. See, social, it's hard to keep up with. Yeah, it is. It, and um, so fancy, for whatever reason, they have their own way of, um, they have their own image uh, meta tags that are specified and it is this is really probably not going to help very much with SEO mm -hmm. but they made it available I took advantage of it because I didn't want to just ignore it once I yeah. knew it was possible yeah okay but that's what the fancy category is um, the other thing that I did is because I have been remiss and I mentioned I'm not a responsive site yet um, I have two instances of the two you know I have the widget both on my desktop um, alternate layout and my phone alternate layout. So in the version area, uh, I've got this flagged as desktop. And then I was kind of in the process of starting to dupe it across pages. But with this page, so with this set, um, that's all that I've touched, that's all that I've done. If I come in and now export or preview this page in the browser and we look at the source code, 
John, maybe you can talk us through what you've done that we can see in the source code and what its value is. All right. So I had seen it here. I think you're generic. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. So. so maybe if I take it from the top just for a second. Um, in the header, as we know, I've got my Google Analytics in there. Um, I think that's the only thing. Yeah, so here's my custom header code. Um, I've got the Google Analytics. And then as we come into the generic section, so this is generated from your widget, mm -hmm. right? What yes. are we looking at? So generic, uh, that's just the robots tag. It's just telling, it's inserting a robots tags, telling it to follow and index the page, which you can change inside the widget if you, for some reason, didn't want that. And then it's take the description that you entered into the widget. That is the description tag um, that Muse also generates. So that's why I say not to add the description to Muse mm -hmm. because the widget is already generating that. Right. And um, and then you'll I'll explain in a second why my widget is generating it instead of Muse. Um, but then the next tag that you have under that is the canonical tag, and that is just basically saying that it's identifying this is a unique page. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have the tag right under that is the face is Facebook's version of the canonical tag. Mm -hmm. And then OG type, that's just a uh, website. So that's why this widget is built for web pages. Got uh, it. Then OG title, it's taking the title that you put inside the Muse, inside the uh, page properties. So the, Got it, right. Yeah. And then, um, so then again, you have OG description. That is Facebook's description. And so it is taking the same description that you entered into the widget and that was entered in the description above. It's also entering it into Facebook's version of the description. So how does that manifest for Facebook and Twitter? If I go to Facebook and I search for a rowing site, it's going to look, I mean, who's zooming who here? What's the relevance of Facebook and Twitter on my website? So now whenever you, uh, whenever you share anything on Facebook or whenever anybody shares anything on Facebook or Twitter, mm -hmm. it will take the uh, title that's generated there as well as um, the image that's, uh, that you've added to mm -hmm. generate a, you know, whenever you share a link, how uh, some sites will have a uh, full-blown image of right something or like a, a going along with the link to the page and then sometimes sites will not have anything. Mm -hmm. um, that is why that image, uh, that tag is important because okay. it's generating the image that you'll be sharing. So there's that, that is the image that I put in the widget. I've got Twitter fancy and then there's the schema JSON bit here. So anything that us normal people need to know about what's going on there? Um, that is just some very basic schema. Uh, just Google introduced schema uh, in the form of JSON LD within the last year or two. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is inserting that, and that is the form of schema that Muse should basically be using, unless, yeah, I'll just go with that. Okay. That's basically. <laughs> what a user it's if someone was doing it on their own that's what they should be using okay fair enough um that's all i got i uh am happy to open the floor to any other questions i don't know if there's anything that we didn't cover john that you think we should um we've got just a little bit more time yeah no i think that was everything we've killed it dead <laughs> well i thank you for letting me put you on the spot um yeah. I would love to, from week to week, start to do this a little bit more. I noticed you suspiciously did not turn on your video. Um, I couldn't turn it on. Uh, sure, sure. No, I, yeah. I, yeah. Able to turn it <laughs> I realized how, as I sit in this room by myself, I talk with my hands a lot, which is really embarrassing. Because <laughs> now you guys can all tell. But uh, I think it does help a little bit to have some faces. Uh, what I'm going to do is throw up another polling question, see how we did today. Maybe if I can get this guy to be happy. So if you 
had any concerns or things that didn't meet your expectations today, please put it in the chat pod so that we can improve. Uh, I had a request to talk more about responsive. I got a nice email from one of our users uh, this week. Uh, and so I think that we're going to go back to responsive in about four weeks. If you uh, do not live in the land of Muse Betas and you're not aware of what we've been working on for the past few months, I highly encourage you to come to our session in two weeks where we're going to give you a sneak peek at what's new and up and coming with the Muse tool two weeks from now. So that will be on the docket in two weeks. And four weeks from now, we'll probably swing back and just dig back into the world of responsive and start showing that a little bit more aggressively. So um, that is it for this week. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Send me your side of the days. We love to look at them. And um, we are going to be Adobe's closed for the week of 4th of July, for what it's worth. So be kind if you have any bugs or questions. We'll be um, at least stateside resting. And then we'll be back, as I mentioned, two weeks from now for our next jam session. All right, people. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah, of course.